in the very late hours on 2nd of July 1993, Dato Idros, better known as Dato Mazlan, a member of the Legislative Assembly of the State of Pahang, mysteriously disappeared. A police report was lodged concerning his disappearance. The police made diligent inquiries. The body of Dato Mazlan was recovered. It had been decapitated and cut into 18 pieces. It was found buried in premises at Uludong, occupied by the appellants. In this case, there was no direct evidence, but the prosecution had adduced relevant facts. The relevant facts are the decapitated body of the disease was recovered from the house occupied by the three appellants and the disease death was caused by severance of his head by a weapon similar to the acts recovered at the same premises. Besides, the day before his death, the deceased withdrew 300,000 from his bank accounts and between 3 July and 18 July, the second and third appellants embark on a spending spare. They spent more than 200,000 during this period of time. Payments by the second and third appellants were made in 1,000 notes, which is the same denomination in which Dato Mazlan had earlier withdrawn his money. The deceased was last seen alive in his car with the second appellant and the body of the deceased was buried in a hole in the ground soon after he was killed. This meant that the hole was dug earlier, leading to the inference that there was a pre-arranged plan on the part of the appellants to kill the deceased. They were convicted and sentenced to death. I feel so satisfied that the accused in this case has been punished and sanctioned to death so that the justice of the deceased and his fellow family has been served and upheld. This case has taught the society outside there that we should not believe any witch doctor or shaman. The punishment that has been served to all of the accused in this case give a great lesson for all of us so that we will not commit crimes in our daily life and everyone can live safely and less worry about their safety. I hope in this era of globalization, there are no more cruel cases like this would happen because as I know, this case is one of the cruelest murder cases in Malaysia. Circumstantial evidence may be defined as any fact from the existence of which the judge may infer the existence of a fact in issue. It is not the evidence directly to the point in issue, but evidence of various facts other than facts in issue, which are so connected with the facts in issue that taken together they form a change of circumstances leading to an inference or presumption of the principal fact. All circumstantial evidence must be directly given in the context of Section 60 of Evidence Act 1950, where the witness must give evidence of what he perceives with his sense. If the circumstantial evidence is in the form of a document, then adherence to the best evidence rule is also a matter to be considered. For example, at the trial of A for murder, a witness says that he saw A carrying a gun at the premises of the house in which the deceased was found shot dead 10 minutes later. 
Here, what the prosecution is trying to do is that, by way of circumstantial evidence, it is inviting the court to infer that the accused shot the deceased. In the case of Jurami Hussein against public prosecutor, which involved the murder of Dato Mazlan, there was no direct evidence but the prosecution adduced the relevant facts which were most were circumstantial evidence as being mentioned in the fact of the case. Justice Gopal Sriram was very much alive to the fact that the case against the evidence rested on circumstantial evidence. He has decided on the matter of the circumstantial evidence in this case by advocating the test of the irresistible conclusion as being adopted in the case of Jaya Raman and others against public prosecutor. Considering the circumstances and especially the conduct of the appellant, there was no misdirection by the learned judge on the law governing the appreciation of the circumstantial evidence. Accordingly, there was no merit in the first and second limb of the argument because the learned judge, in the course of the summing up, took exceptional care to explain to the jury the nature of circumstantial evidence and there was sufficient admissible evidence before the jury which, if believed, would establish the offense with which the accused were charged. The learned deputy in Che Yusuf in this case carefully took the court through the several pieces of evidence that incriminated the accused persons in the commission of the offense and any reasonable jury when confronted with all these circumstances would have come to the irresistible conclusion that the three accused persons committed murder and that they did so pursuant to a pre-arranged plan.